I think nobody would be more surprised at reading the Gospels than the historical Jesus. Jesus would not recognize himself. He would say, what happened after my death? My <laughs> God, I don't get it. And I think that's what the Gospel authors were doing. They were trying to craft meaning out of imitation of things in their cultures that spoke to the to compassion. But uh, I think there was what I call a holy holism in uh, orthodoxy, where they were not as exercised about historical reliability as we are. They were interested in, uh, in some cases, the mystical symbolism. Uh, and then, of course, with the Enlightenment and the, the notion that truth relies somehow in science and history, people were trying to force the Gospels into that paradigm and make them historical and reliable, scientifically verifiable. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's not what they're doing. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, I'm with the man who needs no introduction on my channel. He's been on here several times, and uh, the introduction that is needed is the course that Professor Dennis McDonald is coming out with. It's about mimesis. It's about your lifetime's work in the mimesis of these texts. So a lot of people understand what this is, like, when we look at, even in church, people talk about how the New Testament reflects the Old Testament and some of the things that Jesus is doing are some of the stuff we see in the Old Testament, like, for example, Joseph getting sold from his brothers for 20 shekels. Jesus gets sold by Judas for 30 shekels. The idea of Isaac carrying his own wood to his death, Jesus carrying his own cross to his death. Those are the, some of the things that everyone knows about. There's no secret there. But we don't talk about the Greek side as much. And so I don't want to give away too much because we got the course and you're going to go in deep about this. But I would love to explain one good example of mimesis to just sort of give some people an appetizer so they can go into the course. The course link is in the description, by the way. So, yeah, Dr. McDonald, thanks for coming on. And please give us a good example of mimesis that you think would be a good entry level um, um, version of this. Neil, good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, in Odyssey Book 9, Odysseus and his crew of 10 men put in uh, at an island and when they disembark, they enter a cave and it's the home of a cyclops a one-eyed monster that no one can subdue. They help themselves to the monster's cheese, and then he comes in, and he is not just big, he is enormous, and he by himself can roll the stone over the mouth of the tomb that traps Odysseus and his men, as well as um, Polyphemus's um, cattle, his sheep. He quickly uh, devours raw two of Odysseus's men, and the men realize that they need to escape somehow, but they can't kill Polyphemus, because if they do, um, they won't be able to roll the stone away from the door. So they, plan B is to get um, Polyphemus drunk and to blind him. Now, to do that, they give uh, Polyphemus wine, and because he's a caveman, he's never experienced alcohol. So he quickly gets drunk, and then he asks Odysseus his name. And Odysseus says, oh, my name's just Utus. It's nobody. And uh, that's what my parents and friends call me. And so uh, Polyphemus thinks that nobody um, has, uh, is in his cave. Um, Polyphemus then falls into a drunken stupor, and Odysseus and his men place a, um, a, a timber in his eye and blind him. 
Um, so oh, then Polyphemus calls out to his other Cyclopes and he says, uh, you know, come help me, help me. So they come to the door of the, of the cave and they say, well, who is it who's bothering you? And he calls out and says, Utis is bothering me. Nobody is bothering me. Well, if nobody's bothering you, they say, um, you must be cursed of the God. And they leave. So Polyphemus then rolls the stone away from the door and lets his um, sheep escape. But Odysseus's men are able to escape as well. They take the sheep, they get on the ship, they um, shove off from the ship. And Odysseus calls back and he says, hey, Polyphemus, um, to tell everybody, you know, what I have done. I blinded you. And he's a Polyphemus is the son of Poseidon. Well, um, then Polyphemus says, oh, I didn't know it was you, Odysseus. Why don't you come back and I'll give you a, a gift? Well, uh, Odysseus is too smart from that. As uh, And then he sails off. Now, in book 10, the reader finds uh, Odysseus and his men going to another island. This is the island of the witch Circe, a cannibal, who turns Odysseus's crew into swine in order to eat them later. Odysseus then um, uh, rescues the swine by threatening Circe, but uh, by the end of Book 12, those very people have been drowned in the sea by Zeus. In Mark 5, one reads that Jesus and his 12 disciples sail their boat to a shore. They encounter a savage that no one can bind, and um, he lives among the caves, the, the tomb caves. Um, in this case, it's Jesus who asks the demoniac his name, and he says, we are legion, we are legion. And uh, that is, that is, we are soldiers, similar to the, the Roman legion. The, the selection is, um, is clear. Um, then um, the demons declare that they uh, want to enter into the swine, and Jesus permits it, turns them into uh, the swine, and then sends them off into the netherworld. Um, the, the people who are in the town um, want uh, Jesus to leave their town after they find out what's going on, like the Cyclopes coming to the, the cave with Polyphemus. Um, Jesus does then leave. He boards on a ship, and then he, um, the uh, a demoniac calls out and says, um, take me with you. And Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. Go back to the village and tell them what the Lord has done for you. So whereas Polyphemus boasts that he had uh, blinded Polyphemus and st stolen his sheep, Jesus says, uh, go and announce what God has done for you. Namely, he has um, uh, healed him. So those parallels are really quite striking. And we know that um, early Christian readers, well, Byzantine readers, um, saw the similarities between the two stories because when they went to, um, um, to make poetry out of the Gerasene demoniac, they used the same lines from the Odyssey that inspired the story in the first place. Can you, okay, that last part right there, we need to explain a little bit. When did this happen? How do we know it happened? What exactly, what, what sources are you referring to here? Someone might have, might have no idea what you're talking about. Byzantine, what, what, is, what, is he, what are all these words? Let's um, explain to him. So what time period are we in? Or what, is this, what century is this? And where is this happening at? Uh, well, actually, the time period goes all the way from um, uh, probably the early 5th century uh, to about the 9th century, my guess would be. Um, we have it, um, the Evdosia, who was uh, an empress, 
um, was a poet, and she uh, worked with some philosophers in order to write, rewrite the Gospels by using Homeric lines in order to do so. And that's why they're called the Homerocentones, that is the Homeric stitchings, because these things are restitched together. We also have imitations in the Gospel of um, uh, Nicodemus, especially in the medieval version, and that usually is dated all right to the 10th um, century. Wow. So the point is that we have in the history of uh, interpretation or reading of these texts, uh, people who recognize the similarities between them. Now, I don't think they thought that Mark was, uh, or the gospel authors were um, committing mimesis, but they did see the similarities between the stories and saw that Jesus was more compassionate than the likes of Polyphemus. That's fascinating. So do you have, so we, w later on in these Byzantine writings, like you said, you, they, they, they're using these texts. And so that's, explain to somebody how that makes it evident that um, they're aware of these connections. Oh, because over and over again, when they want to tell a story that appears in the Gospels, they use Homeric uh, language. Exactly. I want to I want to point out my book here, uh, Synopses of Epic Tragedy in the Gospels. How do I do that? Um, and you'll see volume one is on the synoptics. If you look up uh, every word in the Gospels, uh, I translate and it appears in this um, in parallel. It's actually a synopsis of the Gospels with analogies uh, in epic and tragedy. And if you look up the story of Polyphemus, uh, or I'm sorry, the Gerasene demoniac, which appears in all three synoptics, you'll find footnotes that leads you to an appendix that gives my translation of the Centones or the Gospel of uh, Nicodemus. So all of these things are in this reference work. And this work is going to be the backbone of the course that Derek and I are putting together. Well, I just want to say I, I'm completely sold by, by the arguments and evidence that you put forth for this. The 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 uh the course is going to show people who, why I'm so convinced. You just go to the course, you'll find out. But so I'm gonna leave that aside for people to go check out on their own. But I just want the last thing I want to ask you about is what happened to these sort of traditions and methods of these scholars doing these type of things. What what happened? Um, well, first of all. All of these uh, analogies that we have between the Gospels and Greek poetry in this literature comes from Greek speakers and intellectuals in the East. So um, we, this is the Byzantine Empire. They are the, uh, the backbone of um, Greek Orthodoxy even today. The center of biblical scholarship, critical biblical scholarship, though, went to the West and people did not in you know, the Latin speaking and um, then and then uh, other uh, European languages, and they didn't know their Homer. They didn't know their Euripides. These oh. texts weren't even available to them. So they did have Virgil's Aeneid. Right. And we have several examples of rewriting gospel stories by using um uh, the, the lines from the Aeneid in order to retell the gospel stories or the, even the Acts of the Apostles. So we know that mimesis was happening, but they didn't know Homer. Well, of course, um, Western biblical scholarship is related to the Enlightenment, which is an, a European phenomenon and is more oriented toward the Roman, Italian, uh, I mean, the Latin, Italian, and uh, French world. Uh, than it would be, and then later German, um, than to uh, the Eastern Orthodox. So that they, they, so Homer was relatively invisible in the West, uh, uh, really, until after the Enlightenment. So that's one reason that we haven't had a history of biblical scholarship that's attentive to Homer. That was the property of the East. Now that just brings up one one last interesting thought of mine is that do you think maybe before the enlightenment happened that 
religious people weren't taking these texts literal. They weren't taking them as serious. They were taking them more metaphorically. And after the Enlightenment, you had this push for literalism. Everything literally has to be true or else it doesn't matter. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think you're on to something, but I don't know that you've articulated it quite as I would. Sure. I want to, what would, how would you articulate that? I think that in the East, there was an understanding of literature and paradox and um, symbolism that wasn't so characteristic of the West. I mean, it was with some the mystics in the West before the Enlightenment. But uh, I think there was what I call a holy holism in uh, orthodoxy uh, and in the East, where they were not as exercised about historical reliability as we are. They were interested in, uh, in some cases, the mystical symbolism um, and um, the, the poetry of it um, and so on. So I think in the West, there really was um, th that, that kind of holy holism was less common except uh, maybe among some mystics. Uh, and then, of course, with the Enlightenment and the, the notion that truth relies somehow in science and history, um, people were trying to force the Gospels into that paradigm and make them historical and reliable and historically ver scientifically verifiable. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's not what they're doing. Um, so we inherit the Enlightenment but the Enlightenment has blinded us to the art of early Christian narrative. That is so ironic, but also fascinating. It makes me, it makes me have a lot more respect for the people that wrote these texts. And I don't now, I don't, I don't, I no longer lump them in the same category as the people today that revere them as, as these uh, things to live by. But more as more or less, as these were sacred texts that people held dearly. For, for, for different reasons. Well, let me, let me put it just a little differently. I think nobody would be more surprised at reading the Gospels than the historical Jesus. <laughs> I think Jesus would not recognize himself. Um, at points, I think the historical Jesus would recognize himself. But he would say, what happened? After my death, my <laughs> God, I don't get it. Wow, that's something to think about. Well, just want to let everyone know, in the description, there's a link for the course. We gave you a little, we gave you like 1% of what it really you have in this book. And this is a this is a good way. A lot of people aren't readers. I'm a reader, but I also love to like sit down and, and learn from a professor, from a real teacher. So this is your opportunity for a fraction of a unit what it costs to actually go to a university and learn this high level stuff. It's just, it's a must have in my opinion. It's a, <laughs> must, it's a win win for everybody. You're, so, you're too kind, Neil. No, I, I mean that too. Any last thoughts? And besides the link is in the description for the course. I think if you, if you auditors and viewers want to do something that's related to the Gospels in a positive way. It's for yourselves to create something beautiful. Something beautiful that's an alternative to the ugliness that we find around us. And I think that's what the Gospel authors were doing. They were trying to craft meaning out of imitation of things in their cultures that spoke to, the, to compassion. Well, well said, and thank you for your time, and you have just attained true gnosis. <laughs> you have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.